Hey, what's going on, everybody? Nathan Holmes here, Senior Minister of Hamilton Mill Christian Church. I am so blessed and excited that you're online checking out some of the content that we've made available to you. And I hope that it's a blessing to you and helps you to grow in your walk with Christ. Just know that this content is only meant to supplement your growth and not replace your involvement in a strong Bible-based church. It's one thing to watch church online, but it's a whole other thing to be a part of a life-giving church that's on the front lines of doing ministry in the lives of the community and its people. So I'd love for you to come out and join us one Sunday and be a part of what we're doing here at Hamilton Mill Christian Church because I believe that God is doing something great in the lives of the people that are here week in and week out. So thanks and have a great one. All right, church fam, how's everybody doing this morning? Everybody good? Everybody awake? Everybody feeling good in the room? That's good. That's good. Hey, I'm really thankful you guys are all here this morning. Uh, if you're joining us online, I want to say a very special welcome to you. In fact, everybody in the room, turn around and say hi to everybody in the back really quick. Just say, just wave so everybody knows that we're saying hi. Uh, we love you guys. We're glad you're watching. Glad you're with us. Hey, we are continuing. This is week three, part three of this series called Disorientation. And a lot that we've gone over, just so much we've covered really in the, in the past uh, two weeks already. Uh, my head is a little bit disoriented, in fact, already from some of that, and today will be very much the same. And so we have some very tough teaching today that we're going to be sitting underneath of Jesus. And so I just want to ask for your patience and just uh, open heart as we go through it, because uh, it's going to be a little heavy. So just bear with us. So, hey, uh, really quick, couple housekeeping things. If you uh, want to take notes, follow along, we have a way for you to do that. And you're, if you're in the room, there's an app you can download. Uh, and then there's a section there that has sermon notes. We'd love for you to follow along that way. If you're online, you can go over to the right-hand side. If you're, well, if you're viewing on, on our website, you can go to the right-hand side and there's sermon notes over there uh, as well. If you have paper in the room, I don't need any instructions. You know how to do that, so it's all good. We're gonna be in Matthew 5 today, a little bit of Ephesians. I'm gonna reference a little bit of Malachi. Uh, kind of that's where we're gonna be. They'll be on the screen though. You don't have to worry about anything. We'll take care of you that way. At least I hope it'll be on the screen. We've had a lot of little technical difficulties uh, this weekend, so y'all bear with us, okay? Pray for us, please, seriously, it'd be good. Uh, but speaking of prayer, we're gonna jump into that in just a moment, just ask for God's blessing upon our teaching time right now, just ask for open hearts and open minds. Um, and the, the whole goal of today is, I just really wanna answer this question for us, and that is this, why is Jesus so concerned about marital fidelity? That's what we're gonna be looking at today. It's gonna be fun. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you so much uh, for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity we've had to gather um, in, your, in your throne room and worship you. Father, we thank you for this, this privilege that we have. And Lord, we come to this uh, tough topic, and I just pray right now as we enter into this time of teaching, Father, that your words would flow through uh, as, as we just endeavor to open your word, to yield our hearts to you. And Father, we just pray for this, this intersection uh, with your Holy Spirit. Father, we just ask that uh, everything that's said and done this morning would bring glory and honor to your name and your name alone. And it's in your son's Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we kicked off talking about this series about how we really have to be deliberate and intentional about sitting under the teachings of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, we've, we talked about how a lot of people, especially of a skeptical or atheistic worldview, may see Jesus as just a great moral teacher. And yes, he was that. Uh, and then there's others who sometimes only see Jesus as their Messiah, just their get out of hell free card, right? And they just kind of cling on to him and say, he's gonna get me into heaven. And what we're trying to say is he's both and. He gives us both of those things. And a lot of times, well-meaning Christ followers forget that Jesus is a great teacher, that Jesus has some amazing teaching. And if we really truly submit to it, um, the, the worldview, the the ideas and the ideology that he has is far better than what we find in our world's view of things. And so what we wanna do is just be deliberate and sitting underneath that teaching. So we started off with the Beatitudes uh, where he goes through all these different uh, blessed be those who, and he kind of deconstructs, he kind of unpacks this idea that, you know, you've heard it said, but I'm gonna tell you what the true intent was. And last week we talked about anger, uh, really saw that it's not just about murder, but it's really about everything down to slander, gossiping about somebody is, is one of the most grievant, grievant things that Jesus calls out. Um, he talks about condemning somebody, kind of contempt for somebody, and all the way up to just, you know, just bad mouthing them. So all of these things we're talking about causes not only the hearers of Jesus' time to get a little dis disoriented, but it causes us the same thing. Because in the world that we live in, um, we've talked about this before, how very few of our standards and our ideas as Christ followers 
flow in line with the world's or the culture's, right? And I urged you last week that it's really not the culture's fault. Really, if you want to kind of point the finger at anybody, it's, it's all of us in the room, right? We haven't, we haven't been influential enough um, to, to sway culture uh, to do what we feel is right, what we know is the right way, the best way that God gives us uh, through his word. So really, it's kind of, kind of on us, right? And so one of the things that we're having to do in this series is kind of, kind of step back from the way we've been oriented to the world's ways and kind of reorient ourselves to the teachings of Christ. I think about a lot of our college students this week who have started this past week. Uh, I heard about one of our college students had to sit in orientation for literally all day on like Monday or Tuesday of this past week. Uh, You know, that's some rough, I I wouldn't want to sit in that class or that time, but they do that because why? Uh, College students over the summer have gotten used to sleeping in and not doing the things they got to do or or whatever. And so this orientation class is meant to get them back in line with what they need to know for the coming semester, right? That's what we're finding all around our world right now. Everybody's having to get reoriented uh, to this reality that we live in and and where we're at. So this morning, we're going to be unpacking a section of scripture that is in the Sermon on the Mount, which is a collection of teachings that Jesus has, uh, probably his most collective, most concentrated work. And it's something that for each one of us in this room, I guarantee we're going to walk away here challenged today. Uh, I know I have as just as I prepared for this. So uh, I wanna, want you to go ahead and look with me at uh, Matthew 5 is where we're going to be this morning. Uh, Jesus is going to give us some teaching today on the thoughts about our deeds and, and the, the, the ideas behind them, the motivations behind what we do. So let's look at this. Matthew 5, uh, verse 27 is where we're starting. And this is the, the same thing we've been talking about where Jesus says, you've heard it said, or you've heard the commandment that says, you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. So right off the bat, we look at this teaching. And this is very similar to what we saw last week in the case of anger and murder. Last week, Jesus said, you've heard it said, thou shalt not kill. And he said, but I say, if you even have this unresolved contempt or anger for somebody, then you have already broken that commandment. Uh, C.S. Lewis uh, puts it really great. He says this, he says, an apparent trivial indulgence in lust or anger today is the loss of a ridge or railway line or bridgehead from which the enemy may launch an attack otherwise impossible. There's a very lot of, a lot of war language in there, right? That, that the enemy has this, this stakehold on, the, on this rail line or something as it comes into the land. You can hear C.S. Lewis's emphasis here. It, it, just a little indulgence in anger today, just a little indulgence in lust here today, uh, can, you can lose a foothold, you can lose a stronghold in your life and allow Satan to come in and be able to, to do things in your life that he would not normally been able to do if it wasn't for that little indulgence that we had. See, that's what we're talking about is these ideas that there are things that happened in the background of our lives uh, that have significant impact on who we are as a person. And see, Jesus really just totally disorients everybody because they've had it in their head this whole entire time, like, hey, as long as I'm not going around thieving and killing and sleeping around, I'm good, I'm good. And Jesus is like, no, no, you're not. Let's talk about this. So there's this deeper meaning that we have to look at. And I want you to write this down if you're following along. It's it's the first fill in. What Jesus is condemning here is one who deliberately uses his senses to awaken lust and thus break his covenant in marriage. It's someone who deliberately uses their senses. And it says his here, but this ain't a a gender specific thing. This is across the board as we're gonna see in just a moment. But this is something that that if we deliberately use any of our senses, our sight, our our thoughts, uh, our anything, to excite those, those, uh, those, that lust or awaken that lust in our heart, you're, you're breaking that, that commandment. Now, I know there's some, there's some in the room and some may be watching online are like, Nathan, I'm not married, so I'm good, right? I, I got nothing to worry about. And that may be tempting to say. However, <laughs> if we look at the original intent of the do not commit adultery commandment in Exodus, um, we, we know that there were some single ladies in the audience when that was given out to the Israelites, right? Like we know that that was not given to all married folk. And the reality is, is that anytime we introduce that, that third person, it, it's, it's a problem. That's, a, that's an adulterous thing. In fact, if you want to sum it up this way, adultery is like to adulterate or the, the adding of a third person into that marriage. 
So even if you're not married, even if you're single, um, you know, there is this, this hope for some who will ha- enter into a covenant relationship of marriage. And so when you enter into a lustful thing, even if it's just with the eyes or, or whatever, you're breaking that covenant with that person that you will be betrothed to one day, that you will be in a covenant relationship with. For those of us who are married, in that moment of lust or temptation to lust and sin, you're taken away from your spouse and you introduce that third person even just mentally or visually. It's a big deal. It it changes the line, right? It changes how we look at this. It changes how we see things. And you see, Jesus is saying kind of like, you, you just thought it was bad if you were sleeping around. Um, but I'm saying the, the moment of sin happens well before that. The moment of sin actually happens when you, you have that look of like, oh, look at her. You know, or oh, look at him. That's when the moment of sin creeps in. It's not the actual act. It's the, the mental capacity to do that thing. You see, Jesus' definition is, is for all of us, is for one man one woman for life. And you see, when we enter into moments of lust or that temptation to lust, we're introducing another person into that equation. We're introducing another, um, another party into that equation that was never meant to be there. You know, some examples of this, I think, if we really look at the intent behind what Jesus is teaching, I, I think obviously a low hanging fruit here is looking at somebody with sensual want looking at somebody in such a way that you desire that person. Um, I I think you could even go as far as to say that comparing your spouse to another person's spouse, I think that's even crossing the line here. I think you're, you're looking at that other person and saying, you know, hey, if only my wife were like this or only my husband were like that, that's even crossing that line where you're looking at something else with this desire to have in your life. Obviously, reading literature that excites the senses into lust, the viewing of adult material online, which is so easily prevalent. I even say texting another person and, and keeping a secret friendships that your spouse doesn't know about, uh, keeping, keeping secret things where you don't have full transparency in front of your spouse. I, I would say all of those things speak to what Jesus is getting at here. The heart of this is that the marriage should be completely open to each other and each other only with no other influences. You see, here's the summary of all this. Um, Anything that steals our attention, anything that steals our attention from that of our spouse or future spouse is lusting for something less than God's best. You see, that's truly what we're looking at here. I love love to hear people when they they say, you know, oh, God is just down on having fun. God is just, you know, he's just doesn't want you to experience any fun things, whatever, you know. And I always like to point people back to the very first commandment in scripture. Anybody know what that first commandment is in scripture? The very first thing God tells his creation is to be fruitful and multiply. I don't know about you, that's a pretty fun God. So all I'm saying is there's a best way in which you and I get to experience marital happiness. There's a best way in which you and I get to experience the blessings that God has given us here on earth. And it's by living in accordance with his teaching, by living in accordance with Jesus' teaching. So what are we supposed to do? I mean, we live in such a, a sexually saturated world that it's, it's literally hard to turn on a television or God forbid, watch a Super Bowl and not experience some of the things that Jesus is telling us not to indulge in. So what are we supposed to do? I'm glad you asked. Let's look at that. Uh, verse 29, it tells us this. It says, so if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Because it's better for you, there we go, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. So Jesus is speaking in uh, apparent hyperbole here, and I'm very thankful for that because otherwise we'd have a lot of one-armed and one-eyed individuals sitting around in our churches and out at the Starbuckses and driving around in our streets today if we took this verse absolutely literally. But here's the thing. Please don't be tempted to cast this off as such a, like a, a dismissive way of like, oh, Jesus isn't serious. Because while Jesus is speaking in hyperbole, write this down. While he is speaking in hyperbole, he is sincere about the action. Take the escape, get out of town. Like don't, don't indulge in these things. Find a way to escape 
from the temptation that you're feeling. Uh, one of the things that I love to teach, um, not only my, my family, but also any, any young man that I have the privilege of mentoring, is this concept of bouncing your eyes. This is something that we all can do. Uh, it, it's if you see something, because let's face it, you go around this world today, and you're not going to be able to walk more than 20 feet before you see an advertisement or something that would elicit that lust or elicit that desire. So what do you do in those moments? The best thing that you can do is when you see it, you just bounce your eyes. So that means at the beach, uh, the gym, uh, out just around, you are constantly in this state of being aware of what your eyes are taking in and you're bouncing those eyes as much as you can. Another thing I would say for us to do is, is seek that accountability. Seek the accountability. Find somebody in your life. If, if you struggle in such a way where online or, or print material or something is, is causing you to have a recurring sin or recurring temptation, find somebody in your life and say, hey, I need some accountability here. I need somebody to, to hold my feet to the fire to make sure I'm not crossing the line. Seek accountability, okay? Uh, you could cut off that relationship. Whatever relationship that is causing this sin or causing this thing, if it's a girlfriend or a boyfriend or, or whatever, you cut that relationship off. You make sure it's not gonna have that influence in your life. I would say stop hiding things from your spouse. Be transparent, be fully transparent with your spouse so that they, uh, they know you 100%, that they know everything about your life and every little, every little detail they're informed of. Stop hiding things from your spouse. I would say, seek to put up boundaries. I'd say, look at, look at your life. See where there's areas in your life that are, that are wide open for attack. See where your life is wide open for the enemy to enter into and have influence over you. And begin now to, to look thoughtfully at your life and put up those boundaries that are so vitally important. I, I think when you could just stop for today and just just take in this list and just maybe today after we're done here and if you have kids, you're at home and things are quiet or whatever uh, and, and you have a moment, maybe you just, you and the Holy Spirit, you, you get together today and you ask of the Holy Spirit, you know, reveal areas of my life, maybe on this list that I need to take action on today. The areas of my life today that I need to step into and I need to seek that accountability. I, there's a relationship that's just not right. I need to cut that off. I, I need to be more transparent with my spouse and, and communicate with what's going on in my life and where I'm struggling here. I need to put up boundaries in my life. You know, the Holy Spirit, I don't know about you, but every time that I've ever done that, um, he's, he's pretty, pretty bold in his proclamation of where I need to do some work. So I, I would just say, do that because this is so important and the reason why this is so important, and I think Jesus is, is understanding this, obviously. That's this, write, write this down. The eyes seek what is deeply desired in the heart. You see, the eyes are, are, are looking for what the heart is most desiring in those moments, right? You, if, you, if your eyes are landing in certain areas over and over again, I, I would say that you need to start looking at the condition of your heart and asking God, you know, God, reveal to me the, the, the true reflection, the true condition of my heart this morning, in this day. Allow me to see my heart the way you see it. And then allow me to change the way I look around the world based on that. You know, if we look at some of the, the writings of Proverbs, I love how um, it says this in Proverbs 5, 18. It says, let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. I think you could put in husband for those of you who are uh, married. You could put in husbands there. Uh, but the idea is let your husband, let your spouse be that, that thing that you desire most. Let your, let your spouse be that thing that you, you just deeply desire most. You see, husbands and wives, we have to work so hard at protecting that marital relationship. I'm gonna get to this in a moment, but we have to be so deliberate about protecting that that sacredness and making sure that there's no foothold for the enemy to get into. Uh, last summer, we talked about this, uh, Ephesians 5, uh, 21 and um, 23, we talked about the, the importance of the marital relationship. If you missed that, I would encourage you to go back. I think it was like July 28th. You can go back and check that out of our Ephesians series. We talked a lot about this, but it really just came down to this. Husbands, we need to love our wives as Christ loved the church. That's pretty big, pretty big shoes to fill. And wives need to respect your husbands. You, 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 you can sum that whole entire teaching down to that. Wives, love your husbands. 
uh, I mean, sorry, <laughs> husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. If you could master that, which I don't know if we ever could this side of heaven, but if you could master that, I think you would begin to put up so many great boundaries and, and safeguards within your relationship that protect you from some of that, those aspects of lust. But you see, here's the thing. Is that this is about the sacredness of the marital relationship. This isn't about God just restricting you from doing something fun or indulging in something that you really want to do. This is about God honoring and setting up the proper emphasis or sacredness of the marital relationship. Because it's not about the earthly thing that we see here. You've heard me speak a lot about this reality of duality and I have had people that have still asked me questions about what that means. It's simply this, a lot of times we look at the institution of marriage and think that the real thing, the thing that is tangible and real is what we experience here on earth. And that the spiritual significance of that is like the, the, the mist, it's the intangible thing. And we get that wrong. And I think that's the reason why our world is so jacked up when it comes to the idea of marriage today, is because we've thought that all of the emphasis is placed on the marital relationship here and now. That's not what we find in scripture. The importance of the marital relationship is because it's a reflection of what we find in heaven. You see, when we look into the pages of scripture, our marriage on earth should be, and in all reality is, a representation of a heavenly reality. So the reality, the real thing, is the heavenly dimension of marriage, and then the, the spiritual thing, the, the thing that is intangible, that's only temporary, is what we experience here on this earth. Because what the reality is, is that we have a Father, Son, and a Holy Spirit, and the re representation here on the earth of that is the husband, wife, and offspring. Those two things are what goes together. And so many times we get this mixed up. We think that what we experience on earth is the most important thing. And the heavenly thing is like, oh, we'll get to that later. And that's not where God's emphasis is. His emphasis on marriage, the importance of it, the sacredness of it, is not because of what we experience here. It's because of the representation of what it is in heaven. You see, marriage is a covenant that exists between a man and a woman and their God. One man, one woman, and one God forever. And that's the reason why this teaching on lust is so important. And then it goes right into this next section of teaching, which emphasizes the importance of marriage altogether all over again. And that's what I'm gonna look at next. Verse 31, turn with me there. Says, you've heard the law that says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. But I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. Now, I want to pause for just a moment because we read this and we, a lot of people see this as like this escape clause that we've got in the 21st century, right? Uh, and, and while that is true. I do feel like there is some element of that here. We need to be very clear on what Jesus is trying to correct. In the first century, uh, you've heard me talk about this before, it was very difficult for a woman. This is not my teaching. This is not my thing. This is just the reality that it was. It was very difficult for a woman in the first century. A, a man could simply look at his neighbor's wife or an, a, another girl walking down the street and desire that more than his current wife and didn't have to do anything at all except literally walk home and hand his current wife a slip of paper that says, we're divorced, I hear so decree, get out. And then she was cast out of the house with nothing, literally, and was left on her own. This was a common practice and it was used in such a way because they looked back to the Old Testament and they saw what was written there and they figured out a way to twist things and make it work for their own good, their own desires. And what Jesus is saying is that you see why now the, the teaching prior to this is so pivotal now. He's saying that it's not the divorce, it's not the adultery, it's the, the look of want that causes you to sin. It's the look of want that says that's wrong. And so Jesus, when he now comes to this idea of this written divorce decree, he's saying to them, hey, look, you guys are going around just passing out these slips of paper like it's, you know, play money. And he's saying, no, you are defiling yourself and your wife. You need to stop this. And so while Jesus is giving a very clear, um, I guess, escape clause for some, he's also calling these first century men to the carpet and saying, hey, guys, enough is enough. You're not living up to the standard in which I am saying must be present. You see, divorce in the first century was really rough for a woman. It was really rough. 
And so what Jesus is correcting here, Jesus is not endorsing an escape clause. He's not saying that just because this affair or this illicit thing happened, that you just get this get out of jail free card. That's not what he's saying. He's trying to correct a misunderstanding in the first century. But for us, but for us, it also stands as a warning for us because while I'm saying Jesus is not giving us an escape clause, Jesus and thereby God, is very clear about their feelings about divorce. If you look at Malachi 2.16, very clear. For I, God, speaking here, hate divorce, says the Lord of God of Israel. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart, do not be unfaithful to your wife. Overwhelming them with cruelty, I think that's good for either spouse, husband or wife. You can see God's true heart here is for those who enter into a marital relationship to take that super seriously and then understand that even with the oncoming of any kind of marital strife, whether it's affair or anything, money, I mean, that's what the vows are for, right? Till death do us part. But really, you don't really part at death, so that's just a temporary separation. But that emphasis there is so important for us to be able to articulate to the world around us. Many of us don't understand why it's so important that the marital relationship be kept sacred. The reality is God wants us to take it so seriously because it has something to do with him and the way he exists now in heaven. We need to take it seriously. See, even if a man or a woman indulges in these these sinful, shameful thoughts, it doesn't give you the right or the excuse to just up and leave. And, and, And to back that up, I would say, look at last week's teaching, right? If you have a complaint against your brother or sister or anybody that you know, uh, you're supposed to leave your sacrifice and go take care of that before you come into worship. That exists in the marital relationship too. If there's a a riff, an affair, or some sort of thing going on in the marriage relationship, you're to take that and resolve it, to seek reconciliation, to save the marriage, to preserve that, uh, even moving forward. That's hard. I'm I'm not saying that that's any kind of an easy teaching this morning but that's the reality that we find in scripture. You see, this explanation that Jesus gives really um, resets all of the misunderstandings that we've had. I mean, this even plays into, uh, you know, those who are still in the dating world or those who are single, you know, the age old question of how far is too far in your physical relationship with somebody that you're dating. This, this speaks to it. it. How far is too far? Your thoughts. If your thoughts go too far, you've gone too far. Right? If you're even thinking that thought, probably you've already gone too far. But the reality is, is that Jesus gives for us this, this understanding of the value of marriage and the importance of protecting it. Here's the thing, if you're following along, this is kind of your, your sermon in a sentence, I guess you could say. Um, it's just this, is that lust of the senses and attacks on marriage are a primary weapon of the enemy that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've told you many times before that uh, the enemy, Satan, he has a plan. He has a, a war plan to destroy your marriage. He has a war plan to infiltrate and attack your children, for those of you who have kids. For those of you who have grandkids, they have a pl- he has a plan to infiltrate and attack your grandkids. And what I'm saying is, Jesus' teaching here is setting up for us that lust and attacks on our marriages is one of the number one ways that the enemy works. And look at our world around us. Look at the divorce rates that, that are skyrocketing through our world. Look at the, the acceptance of, of adult images and adult entertainment that is just so widely accepted as normal. It's no longer even taboo anymore. We can see that this one area has just ran completely out of control. And again, as I said in the very beginning, sometimes, The best person to look at to see why this is happening is a person that's staring back at you in the mirror. Are we, are you and I, are we setting up? Are we living this out? Are we modeling this? Are we practicing this in our own life? Do we we put those boundaries up? Do we cancel those relationships? Do we we seek to, to always protect that marital relationship? You see, I think when we get down to it, Jesus Again, as he talked about the salt and the light, we need to be so influential in the world around us that the world around us sees us living out these principles, that sees us living out these 
maybe to the world, extreme teachings of Jesus. So this morning, I would say, have you given up on this in sake, for the sake of what the enemy wants, to kill, steal, and destroy? Because I'm telling you, Jesus is here. Jesus comes to bring that healing, to bring that peace, and to bring that comfort and satisfaction in where you're at right now. To where you look at things around your world and you go, those are all great, but what I'm, if you're single, what I'm waiting for is that covenant marriage with my spouse one day. That's your posture now. If you're married, you look around the world and you say, all those things are great, but what I have with my spouse, man, it far outweighs anything the world could ever give me. It far outweighs any temptation or lure or lust that exists out here. I had this beautiful thing with my spouse that, that nothing can tear down. That's what I want for you. That's what Jesus is teaching us about. That's what Jesus is calling us to in this text this morning. Let's pray. Father, we, we come to you just so thankful that, that we have your word to lean on. That uh, through all the pages of history, your word has been a rock for those who are following you, for those who, who love you. And God, we just ask right now that um, as we enter into this time of um, just dedication, decision time, the, this life reflection, Father, you would use your word to guide us through this, that we would surrender our life and even our very wills to what your word has to say. Father, it's so easy for us to get caught up in the world and the teachings of the world and the, the ways of the world. Father, for everybody that's in the sound of my voice, both in this room and, and maybe watching online, Father, we just ask that that you would help, for, uh, help provide some clarity for us. Help us to see things with your eyes. Help us to see this teaching today through the lens of your scripture and through your Holy Spirit. Father, we love you. We thank you for your son. It's in his name we pray, amen. If you're in the room or watching online, I just wanna, two things really quick, if I could. Um, I think about Jesus and I think about the word that is, the used of him and used of us, that he is our bridegroom, that he is, he is coming back for his church, his bride one day. And I love the illustration of that. I love the mental image of that, that Jesus is coming back for, for his bride and we are to be ready for him, we're to be prepared. And so for those watching, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, are you ready? I don't use this line of thinking very often, but if, if the end were to come today, if the end would happen today for you in your life, would you be ready to meet Jesus? Would you be ready to walk into paradise or would you be walking apart from Jesus Christ? It's a very real question that we all must wrestle with. So this morning, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I just wanna give you an opportunity to do that. Uh, if you're in the room, I'm gonna be down front here. I would love to talk with you, begin a conversation with you. If you're not ready to come down, that's fine. I'll be out in this foyer. You could stop by and we could start talking. We could begin that conversation. If you're online, you can hit me up on email. My email is Nathan at hmccfamily.com. I'd love to be able to enter a conversation with you and, and just start talking about how Jesus has radically changed my life and how we can do the same thing for you. For everybody else, those walking with Christ, I think this morning, just as much as last week, um, there is a strong call from our Lord and Savior, but also our teacher, Jesus, to make sure that we're walking with him in the ways that he's teaching. So this morning, I just would encourage you to search your life, look for areas that are not yet surrendered to him. Look for areas that are not yet given over to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And use this time that we're about to enter into as, as maybe a time to kind of realign or reorient yourself with the teachings of Jesus. Would you stand? Let's sing. So I understand that we come to this moment right now and there's a lot of different, you may be in a lot of different places just within this room and watching online. I know that there's things that have happened in marriages um, that are hard to move past. There's conflicts, there's, there's strife, there's, um, maybe there's been affairs, maybe there's been that infidelity. For some, the, the problem isn't within the marriage, it's within your heart. There's lust that exists. There's an addiction that is very active. And the enemy doesn't have a foothold. He set up a whole entire fortress. And there's some things that need to be torn down today. 
I just want to say maybe in this next moment, you know, we're singing this song, do it again. I, I, I love that there is never a sin that is too great that Jesus can't heal. There's never a, a conflict that is too far that God can't repair. And that in every single situation, there is grace that is sufficient enough to cover everything that you and I ever enter into. I don't know about you. <laughs> that makes me very, very thankful to be a child of my heavenly father. So I would just say for the marriages that are struggling, for the marriages that are in, in conflict and strife, maybe this needs to be the, the anthem that you sing over your marriage in this next season. If you're struggling with something in your own personal life, in your own heart, maybe this, this little bridge is something that you just sing over your life in this next season, where you just say, you know, I've seen you move before God and I believe that you're gonna do it again. There's not a single thing that you can't do. There's not a single stronghold you can't break down. So Father, do it again. Do it again. Would you sing?